Welcome to the conversation on TYT. I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited today to be talking about a subject that, uh, while it's not an exciting subject necessarily, and one that we wish we didn't have to talk about as much, it's one that I have spent a good deal of my time, both as a journalist in the field and a journalist uh, on, uh, you know, on the TYT at a desk, talking about, and that's the issue of guns. And I'm thrilled to invite. And, uh, and be talking to Frank Smythe, who has uh, written a book, the NRA, the Unauthorized History. And whenever you see the word unauthorized, which I know uh, they want uh, you to see that word, uh, it, it makes it all the more intriguing. Frank, thanks for being here on, uh, on TYT today. Let's, let's start with that, because I did. I mean, uh, first of all, I should also set this up. Talking about guns, it, today when we are recording this is the 155th anniversary of one of the uh, most famous or infamous, I should say, gun shots in American history. Abraham Lincoln uh, was shot and killed uh, today, or shot and then killed later, but uh, he was shot at Ford's Theater 155 years ago today. So we are still, all these many years later, trying to figure out what to do about guns in this country. Frank, uh, unauthorized, tell me why, of course, that's a, a compelling word. Tell me why that's important here. The reason I chose that, Michael, is that the there are only two book-length histories of the NRA in print until my book, the NRA, the Unauthorized Histories. And those first two book-length histories are each authorized histories approved by the National Rifle Association itself. The first one was released in 1967, before the NRA underwent what's called within its own lore the Cincinnati Revolt, when it embraced gun rights in an unyielding manner, according to its own terms. And that book is hard to find now. It's out of print. You don't see it on any other any NRA displays. It's not on his, their website. It's as if they don't want anybody to know it exists. And then the second authorized history by the NRA came about uh, in 2002, so some 35 years later. And that, uh, that book had a forward by the spy thriller author Tom Clancy. That was authorized. That book is, still exists. But I noticed the gap between the 67 version and the 2002 version. The 67 version had some very interesting materials, including the debts or the fact that the NRA was formed and based on and borrowed its entire original shooting system, scoring design, target designs, as well as its very name verbatim from the National Rifle Association of the United Kingdom, which was formed 12 years before. That was completely whitewashed out of the 2002 version, so I realized there was a great deal more that was whitewashed, so I decided to, to write their history and to call it the unauthorized history, but it's really their untold story according to them. That's it. I mean, because the book has over 650 endnotes, but the most important of which are the NRA documents and magazines. And you're, I mean, just to give a little of your, um, of, of your biography, uh, you are someone who has been exposing uh, the unexposed for a very long time. I feel like, uh, and, and nothing against radiologists, but I feel like a radiologist talking to a brain surgeon here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm such a brave journalist that I will go into Iowa and stand four feet from a candidate with a microphone out, and you are someone who has infiltrated guerrillas in El Salvador, been to Africa, uh, covered wars, and, and I, I stand in awe of that experience. But also, uh, it, the fact that it's all related, it's all about uncovering things that we don't don't know about that other people don't want us to know about. And the NRA uh, is so cloak and dagger or, or cloak and pistol. I, I, I'm, I'm curious as to uh, when the NRA that we know now, the one that seems to have a stranglehold on government, changed from what the NRA was before that, when it was a far more anonymous organization. That occurred in 1977. In 1968, there was the Gun Control Act passed that year in response to the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy, Mal Martin Luther King, and also Bobby Kennedy just months before. And this law banned the sale of interstate mail order guns like one rifle that had been tied to the assassination of JFK. And the NRA at the time supported that law. A group within the NRA saw that as treason, and other activists outside the NRA did as well. The gun rights movement, the modern gun rights movement was formed in the early 70s in the wake of this law, first with the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, then Gun Owners of America, and then the NRA had this shift, as their president called it in a speech in Moscow more recently, 
where they shifted from an organization that was focused primarily on marksmanship and supporting hunters to one that still did those things but made the gun rights their overwhelming driving uh, ideology and its driving mandate, which has continued to this day. Was this, and I don't ask this naively, was this an accidental power grab in any way, or was this totally motivated and, and, and planned out in order to change the organization so that they could do uh, what they have continued to do over the, over the ensuing decades? This was completely planned in advance. Two men, a man named Harlan Carter and Neil Knox, planned for years uh, a plan on taking over the organization. And Harlan Carter became the figurehead, the man who was elected the new leader of the NRA in Cincinnati in 1977. But Neil Knox had organized his followers largely through his own gun magazine columns outside of the NRA, outside of the American Rifleman, the NRA's monthly, through, gun through magazines like Guns and Ammo and others. And he got more than 500 NRA members to arrive in Cincinnati who were eligible to vote and then had his lieutenants out in the audience with walkie-talkies directing them how to vote under his command to go through a series of parliamentary procedures which first attacked the old guard for being allegedly soft on gun rights, and they even had secret uh, audio recordings that they played, then fired the old guard one by one, and then got the, got the floor to then elect them to take over the organization. So it was planned in advance, and really it was a... Uh, something of a coup d'etat, nine years in the works. And, and a, a real success story. I mean, I, you know, you hate to say it that way, but uh, it's a remarkable thing that they've accomplished. And it's unmatched almost. Uh, I would say almost. I can't. I think it might be unmatched in American political activism uh, that, that one organization has this kind of control over so many people. It, it talk to me a little bit about the evolution of that, but also... Is it waning in any way, or is it just as strong, if not stronger, than it was yesterday and the day before? It's, well, three things. First of all, it's been effective on its own terms. It's, it's the most powerful civic organization in the United States. NRA members, NRA gun activists, and others who follow the NRA's lead are incredibly active in voting on elections. And the NRA has created something which is both a fellowship uh, a community of gun owners who are very much united around the notion of gun rights and at the same time uh, engages in lobbying uh, in Washington and other states around the world. They've also been successful in suppressing and burying their own history. They claim that they are the oldest civil rights organization in the nation. This is not true. That's the National Association of the Deaf, founded in 1880. The NRA didn't reference, didn't raise gun rights. The first reference that I saw where they were raising it as an issue was in 1922, so more than 50 years after they were founded, and didn't embrace, call themselves a civil rights organization until 68. So no matter how you cut it, there are other groups that were civil rights organizations first. But the NRA has managed to bury its own history and keeping it secret, which is really quite an accomplishment, including an archive they have in their national headquarters uh, next to their, or beneath, I'm not sure, their firearms museum which is a secret NRA archives that has priceless artifacts going back to the 30s, including movie reels that no one, neither the public nor NRA members, has ever seen. Now, so despite that success they're, they're in lobbying... They're literally, oh, literally burying their history then, right? Literally burying their history. And that's on the, the back jacket of the book actually has that, has that in it, right? That's news. But... So they've been successful in their own terms. They've been successful in burying their history. So people think there's something that they've always been what they are or have been since 77. But the other thing is they're, they're having trouble today because, number one, they've overspent in the election of 2016, which has put them in a position they're still working to come back financially. Kind of like if you max out your credit cards, it takes a right. while to come back. Number two, the cancellation of the NRA annual meeting, which would be coming up uh, just this next weekend in Nashville really hurts them because that's their main fundraising vehicle for both uh, revenue from members, uh, sales, as well as uh, donations from big donors and gun industry executives. They've lost that. So they've laid off uh, 60 members or so of their staff, which is a layoff of that level is unprecedented. And finally, they face an ongoing invest investigation by the attorney general of the state of New York into allegations, and there's credible evidence that these allegations have some merit, 
of mismanagement or the or the channeling of funds that are that have been donated to their tax exempt foundations to the NRA's 5014 social welfare organization which can lobby which is not tax ex tax exempt which is a violation of both New York state law where the NRA is chartered as well as federal law and I think that investigation in particular is not going away on top of infighting that broke out last year between LaPierre, the, the, the longtime CEO, Oliver North, backed up by people like Ted Nugent, attacking each other over excessive spending, in which those allegations on both sides also seem quite credible. If you came to me in the mid-80s and you said Oliver North would be backed up by Ted Nugent and that would somehow be important uh, at the NRA, I'd have shaken my head. Uh, you know, I could talk to you so much about guns. Uh, the book is called uh, the NRA, the unauthorized history. Frank Smythe has the resume, uh, the journalistic resume that should make you want to run out and read this book. It's a, it's a cloak and dagger. I said it before, organization. We don't know as much about it, but we do know that they have a real hold on uh, the way we uh, exercise politics here. And I'd have many more questions for Frank, but hopefully they're going to be answered in the book. Frank, thank you for the time today on The Young Turks. Thank you, Michael, very much. Thanks for watching this free clip of the Young Turks. Don't forget to become a TYT member today. For more exclusive content, join now at tyt.com slash join.